cold calling starting at a high level and then drilling into it more so we can get into the into the weeds in it a bit more but first why should somebody and and i'll phrase this from the lens of both a broker and an investor uh because i think everybody's looking for deal flow why should somebody cold call by the way i was not a fan of cold calling to begin with now making you know i've made over a million cold calls in my career my teams make you know 50 plus thousand cold calls a month you know so i'm definitely a big fan of uh, cold calling for sure when it comes to cold calling as to why i have yet to find a easier simpler process for lead generation, where any individual on planet Earth, probably a little bit easier in the Northeast here, but anyone who can essentially find the data can get in touch with a property owner. The speed in which an individual, whether you have 50 years of experience or zero or five minutes of experience, where you can literally get on the phone with property owners of any any area, of any asset class, any size, anything, besides cold calling. Where like I, I I have yet to find something that is as lucrative, uh, that is as simple, is that is as easy, uh, that is as cost effective. Because it's really just the more calls you do, uh, and the better you get, the better the results you will have, right? And the more deals you'll probably sell over the course of a year. I've learned to fall in love with it. I did not enjoy it at the very very beginning, but I I have yet to uh, you know in spending you know in hundreds of thousands of dollars on advertising and marketing and several different facets, I'm still a big believer, major believer in cold calling and will continue to do so, do so for the foreseeable future. Love it. I love how you even phrased it by saying that you didn't at the beginning, but learn to love it. And when you're good at something, you tend to like it a lot more than someone that perhaps starts cold calling and they suck at it and they're not getting any results and they're just getting mean comments or hung up on all the time. Of course, been, you're going to be there. It. But if you're there. good at it, been there. Yeah, likewise. So have I. What was your background? How do, let's even back up all the way to the beginning. How did you get into real estate? What was what was that whole story? Yeah, so uh, I actually worked at a kid's party place called Pump It Up. It was like uh, bounce houses, you know, basically did kids' birthday parties. Uh, I was the general manager of a location up in northern New Jersey, uh, and I actually oversaw another one. Uh, I was like 20 years old, and I was making like 40, 45 grand a year with no college degree, and I thought I was like king of the world. You know, again, 20-year-old 20 kid, 20 year old kid making, uh, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars 60000 plus a couple things on the side, right? So it's like I was making a ton of money per se for, you know, a no college degree kid, and then a friend of mine was like, hey, why don't we get our real estate licenses? Our mutual friend at the time was in real estate, and he was making like 20000 bucks a month, also like a 20, 21-year-old guy. I was like, I work seven days a week, hundred hour plus weeks. And I know I can outwork this guy. And I was like, if he's making 20 grand a month, who knows what I can make? And uh, I was like, I definitely got to get in this industry. It did not work out very well. The first few years sucked. I had some terrible mentors, but I did learn a lot of what did not work. Uh, and the one big thing I took away from my very first mentor was that she got me into cold calling. She got me into the cold calling world. She's like, you need to be making cold calls. I think this will be really good for you. And I literally told her I'd rather open up a kiosk at the mall than make cold calls, which I, I could not imagine, you know, doing actually at this point in time, but I vividly remember specifically saying that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, thankfully, I, I basically just turned into a game. She's like, the one thing she taught me, and again, this still stuck with me to this day. And look, by, by the way, I made less than $30,000 my first 12 months of the business. It was a terrible experience with my first mentor. But the one main thing I did take away from her was the game of a go for no, right? It was just going for no on the on, on cold calls, which is essentially instead of having this ideal where I have to find all these leads every single day. And I get really frustrated when people tell me no, but turn into a game of no. We're like, I actually get excited. Like, hey, can I get, to, how fast can I get 10 no's? How fast can I get 50 no's today, right? And I get really excited about each no. And then it's just a plus when uh, when they said that they're possibly open to selling. So, you know, that really, really supported me. And, you know, from the non, you know, it's kind of the rest is history. It's a great way of reframing it because a lot of people are afraid of no. They're afraid of rejection. We're almost taught that from a young age is you don't want to say something off-putting. You don't want to be rejected. So to actually frame in the way that you want no, uh, that, that's a, a great way of describing it. So fast forward now, you started with a mentor who perhaps didn't give you the best framework or foundation to work off, but she gave you that really good tip on cold calling. So fast forward to today, how has your cold calling practice or or that element of your business? How has it changed from when you started to where you are today? I'll give you like maybe the biggest differences, right? Like I just focus on the biggest differences, right? So one of which is the who I'm specifically calling has be, it has changed slightly, right? I, I was doing a lot of investment sales in the residential world, right? Like I, that was my specialty when I first got into it. I was in the foreclosure business first per se almost 10 years ago, which, you know, coming out of the recession period, 
and and now you know we essentially do investment sales in the commercial world, right? Like, so like the the type of product that we're specifically calling has adjusted. One, two, the scripting which originally was going as a real estate agent to now I'm calling as a principal, right? I call as a principal most frequently because I am a principal. You know, I know you buy a lot of properties. I, I do as well. Uh, so the script that we work on is typically use uh, use as me being a principal. Uh, so that was obviously not the case uh, many years ago. Uh, as well as number three. I still make somewhere in the vicinity of like 150 to 300 calls a day. I mean, that's about average for me, right? Maybe 500 to 600 calls a week, roughly, based on my scheduling. However, I mean, like I had mentioned at the very beginning, my team makes over 50,000 calls a month, right? So we have a lot more systems around building a sales team where I'm not the only person making those calls. You know, at the very beginning, it was just me by myself. And now we spend a lot of time, energy, and effort in attracting and building a sales team and educating uh, individuals on you know, replicating basically what I've created. So how many sales people do you have to be making 50,000 a month? About 22 right now. And are they based on salary? Are they based on what, 100% commission or a split on it? Yeah, 100%, 100 commission. commission. I found that and that's typically better. I, it's, I, I found it to be a lot better. Like if you're looking to build a sales team, just real quick, uh, you know, I have found there are infinite, I'm, I'm, by no means am I trying to tell you I figured this out. Okay, like I've had you know you know sales teams on you know, on and off for the last ten years, right? Like, I, and by no means, like I feel like I'm we're in a good stride right now, but by no means do I think I'm an expert in sales team building. We're doing okay, and at the same time, I mean, I've tried everything. I've tried crazy high splits. I've tr you know in in in, in very low value provided. I've tried, you know, compensation of in salary and, and commission. I've, tr uh, I've tried, you know, uh, low compensation, high value, you know, it, it, there's so many different models that I feel like can be successful. And I think that it's just sort of the one thing I can just kind of say in it is that you're going to make mistakes and every single individual that you bring on is going to be slightly different, right? Every, or that you're interviewing for a team position per se. So what we've tried to do is stick with a one track mind. We have an avatar, we stick to the avatar. If they don't meet the avatar, we don't recruit them. Because the second we deviate, we typically, it becomes infinitely more difficult down the road. It creates culture issues. We've just been down the road so many times already. It's just like, we know what our avatar looks like. If they fit the mold, fantastic. If they don't, no problem, you know, and we'll recruit them to the brokerage and, you know, let them do whatever the heck they want. But, you know, it's like, or, you know, but, but to be on the team, we, we have very, very, very high standards. So is that position just making outbound calls or is outbound calls part of the role where they're also still trying to broker deals? You know, we, everyone's still licensed. It, it's very similar to that, but we are not trying to list properties. Our first t intention is not to go out and list a bunch of properties for sale. Our intention is to find a bunch of sellers who are looking to sell for a fair and reasonable price in which our buyer clientele, we have over 8,000 buyers that we work with, you know, about two dozen of them are VIPs that we do the most business with, but we have a database of over 8,000 buyers where we're finding good product for them. That is our intention. And if it does not, like I'm also an investor, so like I'm sort of the first person to take a look at everything, right? So it's, you know, it's a great funnel for me to buy some properties. Uh, but if it doesn't fit my buy box, then it goes to our, our buyer pools. If it doesn't fit our buyer pool criteria, then we list the property for sale, right? So the the, mm -hmm. the vast majority of what they're focused on is making those calls, which any any one of them makes between 350 and a very bare bare you know bare bare minimum to a thousand calls a day. Uh, the intention is to get three leads a day, two right right up two LOIs a day, and pitch for at least two listings a day, right? Like those are our bare, you know those are our minimum metrics that we go off of every single day. And our intention is that like they're not just pushing for listings, right? So like they'll get a lead, we make it a starter offer for like an offer that I would make personally based on their response rate of that offer. We then transition into, uh, you know, possibly brokering it off market or pitching them with the opportunity to list the property for sale if the pricing is, doesn't meet any one of our buyer criteria. Yeah, so so fascinating how you work that through the funnel system and it works on all levels. You get to see more deal flow, especially off market uh, properties. Then you've got VIP buyers, and then you've got other buyers, and you have a chance to list it. So I, that, that's a very deliberate and structured system that that you've got there, and I'm, I can see why it's been so successful for you. When you have a sales agent reaching out to initiate this conversation, and you don't need to give the exact script uh, that that you use, but in essence, what are you trying to convey in that first 
truly cold call that you may go to the to a new contact yeah so uh, by the way if they go to my channel it's literally for free they can download the exact script book that i hand my agents right like they can download that script book for free uh but the, the script the opening line essentially goes like this and now it's a, you know some some slight variation of this because we use a couple different opening lines i literally use these opening lines as practice throughout my team so like we try to make a lot of adjustments and see and track every bit of data to try to see maybe if there's any type of languaging changes that we can make where we could probably possibly get better uh, response rates. So essentially it's like this, hey, uh, hey, Chad, this is Henry with EXP Commercial. Uh, you know, how are you doing today, whatever. And then we go into, we are working with a, a client who's going through a 1031 exchange. And I was just curious if you might consider selling your property, right? Or would you be totally against selling your property? I mean, we, we use so many different variations of that opening line, but again, hey, Chad, it's Henry with EXP Commercial. I'm working with a client who's going through a 1031 exchange. And I'm just curious if you'd be totally against selling your property. That is essentially the uh, foundation of our scripting. Now a couple pieces gets changed, right? You know, uh, sometimes we go with the opening line of how are you? Sometimes we don't. Sometimes, you know, we sometimes use the person's name. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we use the, the entire property address. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we just use the street name. Sometimes at the very end, we say, are you totally against selling your property? Would you be open to selling your property? Would you be, you know, have you considered selling your property? We literally test and trial everything repeatedly to try to get the best data so that I can try to provide that on the, on the YouTube channel to try to give people some better ideas of what will best work for them. So the first call is basically basically just trying to see if there's an itch that you can scratch. So you're, yeah, you're hoping correct. for them saying, well, I hadn't really thought about selling, but what's, what's it worth? What happens is this, Chad. So a, a lot of what happens is that we also teach the, the, the pivot strategy. We call based off of, we have a client who's looking to buy properties. Okay. Cause we have several and they're looking to buy them, you know, like you would do. Right. And then as soon as they respond, right? So Chad, let's say I called you on one of your industrial buildings. Just say you're not interested in selling. Right? It's like, Hey Chad, this is Henry at the XP commercial. Just who's calling you about your property at one, two, three main street. Just curious if you were totally against selling your property. Yeah, no, I'm not interested. I hear you, Chad. And actually, just look, you know, while I was actually looking up uh, looking up this property here, I see you own a number of buildings locally. I'm just curious. I know you're not looking to sell. No problem at all. I'll let my buyer know. But how, would you be totally against possibly buying another great deal if it was something similar to 123 Main Street? Yeah, if the right deal came along. Perfect. That's what so many of these people are saying, right? So like all of a sudden now we pick up another buyer mm -hmm. lead. So we, we shift it. Uh, we, you know, we use a pivot strategy where do not beat them up. If they're not looking to sell, they're not looking to sell. But most of the time, it's either a knee-jerk reaction, right? Not looking to sell. I mean, how many calls do you get a day on your buildings like I do. We get tons of them. We like to uh, immediately pivot into a buyer conversation, provide some value and send you a couple of deals. And then later down the road, we might end up getting that sale, right? Where like maybe today you're not mm -hmm. open to selling it, but hey, if we got you, you know, possibly 20, 30, 40, 50% over what you paid a year or two or three or four years ago, whatever it was, would you be totally against selling? It's not always like this one track mind. Like we have multiple lenses for that funnel. Like we had discussed, we have multiple lenses for that conversation and we're not fixated based on the response, right? I educate my salespeople and say, listen, we are here to facilitate a transaction when the time arises. We are not here as forceful people to make them sell when they don't want to or buy when they don't want to. That no one, <laughs> that doesn't happen. We are here to give options and facilitate when things occur. And that's all we do. It's brilliant in its simplicity because there's nothing overly complex about that system, but very few people are, are actually taking that pivot approach.